start with a little prayer, shall we, to uh, St. Michael, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray, and do thou, O Prince of the heavenly hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Sacred Heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, we'll talk uh, now about confession. And there's a couple of elements to confession, a couple of things that uh, uh, are really important to bear in mind. What do you do when you go to confession? Well, you publicly admit your sin, meaning another human, at least one, in this case one, hears them. They hear your sins. You recount your sins to them. This happened all the way back in the Old Testament. People think that this confession thing, going telling your sins to another man, is some kind of new Catholic thing. This went on for thousands of years before. You used to, as a matter of fact, have much more of kind of a spectacle about it than even today. Now, there isn't really much of a spectacle at all today. You can quietly go to a priest privately and say, Father, can you hear my confession? The two of you privately go to confession, and you go on about your business, and no one else on earth even knows you did it. But in the Old Testament, we hear that God set up a, uh, uh, a, a public spectacle for people to be forgiven of their sins. And it's out of that understanding that confession comes. The Jews would have to sacrifice animals for their sins. Publicly sacrifice animals. And the more, the bigger a sinner you were, and the more egregious your sin was, the bigger and more notable your sacrifice had to be. So, you know, if you're pulling the ox up towards the temple, people are like, that guy didn't just steal some Reese's candy bars. He did a little bit something more. But even more than the actual size of the animal is that the person, you know, we have this think, uh, thought in our head that you would just take the animal and give it to the Jewish priest and he'd sacrifice the animal and throw the animal on the fire and burn up and, you know, and that was... No, that's not what happened. You, the sinner, had to kill the animal. You had to do it. And you had to slit the animal open and reach in with your arms into its guts and get the blood all over you and take out the part that was going to be burned up as sacrifice and you gave it to the priest. The priest then took it and placed the offering, and it took the entrails and placed them on the, uh, the fire and burned them up. But he just stood there waiting for you to do all the dirty work. Why is that? Why did you have to kill something? Why did you have to get blood on you? Remember what the Jews thought about blood. It's a horrible thing. You couldn't touch it. Couldn't have it anywhere near you. Why would you have to kill something? Because the notion of sacrifice, the... the what lies at the heart of sacrifice is the exchange of one life for another. This is why we read in the Old Testament that without the shedding of blood, 
there is no forgiveness of sins. Because if you don't, if there isn't that exchange, if there isn't that I can't pay this out of myself, something else has to come in and make the payment for me. There can't be a forgiveness because something else has to make up for. If I borrow a hundred thousand dollars, if I borrow that and I don't have the money to pay it back, how can I, how can the person whose that debt is owed to ever reclaim their money? How can they ever be made whole again? I can't do it. Something else has to be brought into the picture for me to be able to be restored and that person be able to be made whole again. Something outside of me has to do it. So if I borrow $100,000, well, I need to get that $100,000 and I go spend it on whatever I want to spend it on. Now I need to get $100,000 to give back to him. You know, we hear the parable of our blessed Lord where the, uh, the man comes in and he says he owes, uh, uh, you know, the king calls him in and says, you know, you owe me X amount of money. And the guy's begging and pleading, I don't have it, I don't have it, I can't pay you, please, please. And the king writes off the total debt. He just totally writes it off. And then that guy gets up, whew, that's great. And he's walking down the street and he bumps into a guy who owes him money. And he grabs him by the neck and starts throttling him and says, pay me back everything you owe me. And the guy goes, I don't have it, I don't have it. And he goes, well, I'm going to throw you in jail until you do. And so the king hears about it because people say, oh, he forgave him his money, but this guy turns around and throws that guy in jail. That doesn't seem right. So they go and tell the king. The king drags the guy in front of him and says, you lousy servant. I gave, forgave everything to you and let you go, and yet you wouldn't extend that same blessing to somebody else, that same forgiveness of debt to somebody else. So if that's how you choose to treat him, well, that's how I'm going to choose to treat you. I'm throwing you in jail, and you're not getting out until the last penny's paid. Now, the interesting thing, if you read these details of that parable, uh, the sums of money are actually mentioned in there, in that parable. The money that the, uh, the second guy owed the first guy was about, if we worked it out, it'd be about three or four months' worth of pay. It's a lot of money, but you, it's not overcomable. I mean, you can pay it, and you can say, well, you know, I owe you whatever. Well, you know, how much money do I make a month? I don't know, say $2,000 a month. Okay, I owe you about $8,000. It's going to take a while to pay it off, maybe a couple of years, but I can pay it off. You know, I'll give you $150 a month or something. At the end of a number of months, I'll have it paid off. But the guy who owed the king the money, if you figure out how much it was, it was more money than he could make in an entire lifetime in an entire lifetime, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the king wrote it off. And that's sort of the heart of that parable, that the man who was forgiven so much wouldn't turn around and forgive a little bit. So when we go to confession, if we are confessing a mortal sin, any sin either, actually, but specifically a, a, a mortal sin, we're never able, ever able, to get that forgiveness on our... We can't pay back the debt of a sin. We're not capable of doing it. You can't pay back more money than you will make in your lifetime. Let's say we all live to be 100, and we keep working every day of our lives, no day off, until we die at 100. And at the end of 100, we've earned a million dollars. Well, if you owe 10 million, how do you pay off your debt? You can't. It's impossible. Somebody else has to step in and pay off the debt. Something else has to come and be exchanged for the debt. 
So this idea of the sacrifice when the Jews used to come and bring the animal, the animal was a symbol of the person's forgiveness, uh, need for forgiveness. They recognize, they make a public admission of their sin. That's why they're there. They're there hauling their animal up, their goat or their lamb or their ox, their bull. They're hauling it up the steps. They're not there unless they're a sinner and they've done something that needs forgiveness. So they're standing there in front of the big, huge crowd and picture the scene. Here's the temple, the, all the big, huge stairs going up to it. There's an altar over there. Beyond that, there's a fire pit. The grill on top and all the pieces and parts of the animal are being put on the fire and the smoke is going up to God. You're not at this event unless you're a sinner. So you're standing there, just your mere presence there means you're a sinner. It's like the guys on the side of the road wearing orange, picking up the trash. Their mere presence there wearing the orange means they're prisoners. In the United States, you guys have those here in Toronto? You know what I'm talking about, right? In the United States, if you're kind of a petty thief or you know, in your, you're in county jail, not full-blown federal prison, but if you're in county jail, one of the things they do is they say, okay guys, get up, let's go. They load you up into the minivan and off you go. And you get out of the minivan and you clean up the litter on the side of the roads. And everybody knows who you are or knows what you are because you're wearing your prison clothes. You're wearing your, these bright, ugly orange uh, outfits. And everybody goes, oh, they're wearing bright orange tops and bottoms. That means they're prisoners. Now, they have, they're not murderers, but, you know, they're the people who stole the candy bars. Uh, so your mere presence tells people, oh, you know, criminal. Just the very fact you're there doing that means you're a criminal. Well, this is the same thing true in the, you know, with the Jews at the temple. The very fact you're bringing an animal to sacrifice means you're a sinner. Well, we have the same thing if you're in confession in a church and you're in line for confession. It means you're a sinner. Well, we're all sinners, but more to the point, it means I've committed a sin now that I need to go ask for forgiveness for because I've committed this sin. And you're standing there kind of like, hmm, hmm. And your mere presence there means you are in need of forgiveness. Well, God understands that, you know, even the best of us sins and sins routinely. The, uh, uh, the Psalms say, or Proverbs says that even the just man falls seven times a day. That it's very, very, very difficult to be perfect. Although we're commanded to be perfect, our blessed Lord says that, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's the goal. It's extremely difficult, but it's the goal. And it's the command. God doesn't command us to do something that we, can't, we don't have the possibility of doing. That would be unfair and unjust. So what we do through the sacrament of confession, in addition to obviously being forgiven the sin, uh, uh, is develop a sense of a reliance on God. So a number of things that happen with each of the different sacraments. There's the actual sacrament itself, the what's going on, and then there's the kind of uh, side effects, the graces that come to us from the sacrament that, are, that have kind of the indirect effect on us. And you'll always hear good Catholics joking about going to confession, not making fun of it in the sense of that, but kind of incorporating it into their humor, like, oh, got to go to confession for that one. Because they recognize, see, it establishes a mindset, and it develops a habit of thinking about, I messed up. The same way people who wouldn't admit that they were wrong if you gave them all the tea in China, they think that way about themselves because they have habitually, over the course of time, 
never thought about being wrong. They can't admit they're wrong. They won't admit they're wrong. They just don't think in terms of I did something wrong and I need to fix it. Well, people who, are, who do think in these terms are much more able to approach God. They're much more able to, they're able to approach God with a certain ease and a certain comfort. They, they relate to the truth of what God teaches them. They relate to the truth. And because of that, they're, in a, they're what we call more disposed. They're more disposed to sort of absorbing the truth, being open to the truth. And the difference is perhaps between two windows. You know, the sun is up there in the sky shining. It's shining, you know, on the building, shining on the windows. The window that's dirty, yeah, the sunlight comes through it, kind of. But the window that's clean, the sunlight just pours through that window. And that's the sort of the effect on our soul. Sure, the, the, the really clean window can still have some smudges on it and, you know, a little streak of this or that, or maybe you leaned your head up against it and there's a little glob of oil there or whatever. But for the most life, for the most thing, it still comes through. The light still comes through. And as a matter of fact, because the window, because the window is so clean, a little fingerprint on it actually looks glaring, right? Because the window's almost perfect. And then that one little smudge stands out. Well, that's how somebody who goes to confession regularly is because they're so regularly clean, cleansed, pure, that even the slightest little smudge to them is this big thing. Because it's, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. If the goal is perfection, and you're taking a test in school and you get a 99 on the test, you're like, oh, are you kidding me? I got a 99? But if you got a 30, you don't go, wow, I wish I'd have had just one more. Because it doesn't do any good. So, for the soul, for the person who is aware of their sin and aware of their need to be forgiven of the sin, that person's going to get up and do something about it. And the more they do that, the more frequently, and they see themselves that way, they become like the clean window. Will they be perfectly clean? Eventually they will be. Yes. Yes, eventually they will be perfectly clean. But for the dirty window person, you know, in their brain, it's like, eh, well, the windows, eh, look, some light's coming through, and the window's dirty anyway, so what does it matter if I just kind of smudge it up a little bit more? It doesn't really make that much of a difference. That's the person with the 30 on their test. And eventually what happens is that dirty window just gets dirtier and dirtier, and eventually it prevents the light from coming in almost totally. So it's not just a question of where am I right now, it's also a question, a larger question, where am I heading? Where am I heading? What are my choices inclining me toward? Which trend am I setting here? And people become, we, we are all creatures of habit. We are, that's just how, I don't know why we are, it's just that's the way we are. If you have a favorite color, you generally tend towards that favorite color in whatever, the color of your room, the clothes you wear, whatever. It's just how we are. We get just comfortable in things we like and the way we are with each other. And we each have personalities and those personalities get rooted in our habits how we view ourselves, how we look at other people, how we relate to other people. And we get so comfortable in those habits, those habits of our personalities, we get so comfortable in those that if we change, if something changes and we act differently, people say, what's wrong with you? Why are you acting that way? 
And you go, what do you mean? You go, I don't know, you're just acting different today because you've changed the way you are whatever, for whatever reason. I don't know, maybe you woke up with a headache or you know, if you're generally a cheery person and you are walking around the house grumpy for two or three days in a row, people say, what's wrong? Or if you're generally a grumpy person and you're very nice for two or three days, people go, what's gotten into him? Did he win the lottery? Well, why do, they, why do people think like that way about us? And why do we think that way about us? Because we develop habits. We develop habits, we are a certain way, and we just become that. And the more we are whatever way we are, the more we become that way. It's how humans are. So the human being that doesn't really think of themselves in terms of a sinner in need of forgiveness will tend to never really think of themselves in those terms. And so they will never think of themselves as ever having sinned, really. And they'll never really think of themselves as being wrong. And then they'll never be able to really think of themselves in terms of having wronged someone else and they'll never see or be able to recognize the hurt that they may have caused someone else. And they tend to go through life becoming more and more self-ish. Just thinking about themselves. And they don't think in terms of my relationship to other people and my relationship to God because they're just thinking about themselves. And the more they think about themselves, the more they're gonna think about themselves in the future. It's a habit. But the person over here who recognizes, I shouldn't have done that. That was really wrong. Nope, shouldn't have said that about her. Nope, it's not her fault. Well, maybe it is her fault, but I shouldn't have said it anyway. Yeah, that wasn't good. Yeah, you know, I probably sinned. I shouldn't have done it. That kind of person thinks about the world differently because they think about themselves differently. This person is going to be much more inclined to consider doing good for somebody. This person is going to think more about their relationship with God. This person is going to see that little smudge on the window and really not like it being there and want to try to clean off the window. This person, they may see the smudge, they may not, and they may not really care that it's there because there's so many smudges and smears on the window, it's just not that big of a deal. This is why our blessed Lord says, the first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second commandment is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. There's only three things you can love. God, your neighbor, or yourself. The person who loves himself to the exclusion of others we call self-ish. And the person who loves God and loves his neighbor, loves his neighbor as much as himself, this person is going to heaven, and this person is going to hell. There's a reason the first commandment is the first commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. When you are in that mindset, you go to confession, because you know that your sin has offended God. You may not like the idea of having to go to confession. Nobody likes the idea of going to confession. And you may, like the, you may like confession as a proposition, but look, at the end of the day, you're kneeling down there and you're saying, I was horrible at this, I sucked at that, this was a rotten thing to have done, I lied, I cheated, I stole, I blew up. Who wants to sit and do that? We don't even want to do that in the mirror, much less telling it to somebody else. We don't want to do that. But because we love God, we will make ourselves humble before somebody else. 
And see, this is the difference when people say, I can just tell my sins right to God. Sure, you can tell your sins right to God. How easy is that? Hey, God, yep. I said, well, what are you telling God? He doesn't already know. I murdered three people on Tuesday because they wouldn't let me have my Reese's Pieces. <laughs> Big deal. Wow, that takes a real man to step up and do that. God already knows you murdered them. You're not telling him something he doesn't know. Ah, but to go to another human being and have to humiliate yourself in front of that person, and it is humiliating. This is why if you go to confession and you deliberately choose not to say something, that is not to confess a sin, if you deliberately avoid it and do not say it, you've made what the church calls a bad confession. You haven't confessed. You've tried to hide something. You've actually gone into a forum where you're supposed to totally bear the truth and you lied in it. It's like getting up on the witness stand and perjuring yourself. Here's the supreme moment that you are supposed to tell the truth and you, re and you hold back and don't say something. <clears throat> Bad confession. And what is the purpose of confession? The purpose of confession is to have our sins forgiven so that we can be restored to the purity of that relationship with God. You should never, A, avoid confession. You should make a habit of going to confession probably at the bare minimum, at the bare minimum, once a month, but more routinely at least once every other week. There are many people who have the ability to get to confession every week. That's very good. That's, that's perfectly fine. But you should absolutely, absolutely try to get to confession on a regular basis at least every two weeks. And it's kind of like emergency reason you can't go that you should go once a month. I mean, unlike, you know, some Catholics in other parts of the world where there aren't many priests or parishes, or, you know, Catholics are a very small number, sometimes it's difficult, and if you, can't, if you can't do it, you can't. But here in the West, we have the opportunity to go to confession with a degree of frequency and regularity, and we should. The old expression, confession is good for the soul. Oh, yes, it is good for the soul. It's very good for the soul. And when you do it regularly, when you go to confession regularly, you keep this window in front of your face, and you see the smudges. And every time you go to confession, you're cleaning off that window. And the more you clean it off, the more inclined you're going to be able to, the more you're going to be able to see a smudge if a smudge hits it. And eventually, like anybody who keeps the window clean, they're just going to keep it clean and they're going to make sure it doesn't get smudged. They're going to make sure that they don't, they think in terms of when something becomes a habit with us, we think in terms of that habit. You know, if you like, you know, I, I, I like Dr. Pepper. Love Dr. Pepper. I gave it up for Lent. It's one of the things I gave up for Lent. I've messed up twice already. Um, said to my father yesterday, he was sitting in my uh, office at the studio, and I just reached into the fridge and <laughs> cracked open a Dr. Pepper, and I slammed down half of it, and I said, boy, I'm glad breaking Lent isn't a sin. <laughs> just needed a Dr. Pepper. It was just weakness. It wasn't a sin. But... Uh, when you think in terms of, of when you think in terms of uh, wanting to be good and be perfect, and you make the habit of that, little itty bitty things you do that are wrong stare you right in the face, and that's good. You don't go commit suicide over them. You fix them. You don't walk around and go, oh, I'm horrible. Go fix it. That's what you do. Yes, you can regret your sin. You can, you know, 
to a healthy degree, feel bad that you've done something wrong, but then go fix it. You don't live in your misery, you just go or the effect of your sin, you just go fix it. You confess your sin to God uh, in the sacrament of confession. If you've wronged somebody, you go mend the fence with them as much as they uh, you know, will allow you to do that, and you get on with your life. It's just that simple. The person who's able to do this is going to be a person that people like. They'll just like them. Why? Well, first of all, you're humble. You're a humble person because you understand who you are in relation to God. And people like you. They won't like you necessarily because you're humble in relation to God. They won't go, oh, I like people who are humble in relation to God. They'll just like you because you're humble. If you're humble, you'll be deferential towards people, you'll say hello, you'll be polite, you'll be thinking of them. Everybody likes being around a person like that. They may not like you because of your religion, but they'll like you because of the type of person you are. But the person who is arrogant and proud, nobody likes this person. They may hang around this person because this person may be rich or you know, have, you know, be popular or their dad makes a lot of money or something like that but they won't like the person, they'll like what they can get out of the person. Nobody likes being around a jerk. Nobody. And jerks are not people who go to confession on a regular basis. They just aren't. You can't go to confession on a regular basis, learn in this sacrament, because remember, the, all the sacraments have these graces that kind of spill over. It's like a fountain in a great big city park, a great big fountain. Yeah, the water absolutely shoots up and comes back down and is caught in the basin. And, but if you're standing anywhere near around it, you also feel the mist coming off it. There's kind of this side effect of the sacrament as, as well. And that's the kind of extra grace. And you become a better person. Better meaning good. Good meaning holy. You be, that's the point of the sacraments, is to make us holy. And when you are holy, people like you. I'm not saying go to confession so people will like you. I'm saying that's a nice side effect. And you know this. If you're around somebody who is a genuinely good person, genuinely good, they have their life in order, they have their brains uh, functioning the right way, they're not on drugs, or they're not an alcoholic, there's none of that drama in their life. They're just simple, straightforward, nice people. Everyone likes those people. And what they like in the person, whether they understand this is what they like or not, what they like in the person is God. They see God in the person. They might not say it that way, they may not have the vocabulary to articulate it that way, they may not even understand it that way, but what they are seeing is holiness. And I've had a great opportunity because of what we do to be around an awful lot of very holy people and you just love being in their presence. They're sweet, they're kind, and don't get the funny notion in your head that holy people walk around going, oh no. Yeah, some holy people do because that's their personality. Other holy people have got hysterical personalities. They're, they tell great jokes, they're funny, they carry on. So I think some people get this notion in their head sometimes that holy people, that holy people are kind of boring and dull and slow and aren't any fun, and there's something weird about them. And lots of holy people are hysterical people, great senses of humor, fun to be around. People have personalities. Some people have great personalities, other people don't have great personalities. But if a person is holy, there's this, there, it's kind of like being around a fire, you know, in the, uh, in, in the, on a cold day. You just sort of warm yourself by the fire. 
Well, the fire is, sure, the fire is coming through the person, but the fire is originating with God. And that's what we're supposed to be. That's what the sacraments do. They make us holy. When you move through the average Catholic life, most of the sacraments that happen to us happen to us once. You're only baptized once. You're only confirmed once. You're married, God willing, once. Or you're ordained a priest once. But the other sacraments, the two that we regularly participate in over and over and over and over again are confession and Holy Communion. Those are the two kind of repeat sacraments. Keep coming back for more. And the one feeds to the other. So we go to confession ultimately so that we can prepare ourselves to receive Holy Communion. We fix the room up inside our souls so the King can come in. And if you're fixing up the room and you're in the mind of fixing up the room and getting everything together, making everything the way it should be, then you recognize, wait a minute, that table's out of place. Whoop, I need to get that in order over there. Whoop, gotta fix this. Gotta get that ready. And when we think in those terms, we become better people. I don't mean better at math or history or politics. I mean we become better people holier people, we become good people. And we get that way, we get that way because the grace of God comes to us from the sacraments, through the sacraments. You know, what is a sacrament? It's an outward expression of the grace of God. It's a visible sign where we receive the grace of God. And in the sacrament of confession, when we present ourselves as, here I am, I'm, I've sinned, whatever the sins are, and I'm truly sorry. It's kind of a come-to moment. You know, we can think in our brains, we can walk around if we've, you know, said something horrible about a friend and, you know, we've had a fight with them or something. We can walk around in our sort of natural way we are as humans we can walk around and say to ourselves in our own heads and just to ourselves, oh, I shouldn't have done that, I guess. But it, kind of, but it sort of ends there. It never really gets out of it. It never moves beyond that. Unless you have that sort of come-to moment with the person you said something about. You have to have that moment, like, you know, I need to talk to you. And they go, yeah, what do you want to talk about? Well, you know, I shouldn't have done X, Y, and Z to you. I shouldn't have said all that stuff behind your back. I shouldn't have blah, blah, blah. Really, why did you? Well, I don't know. I was jealous, you know. You know, you, know, you liked him, and I liked him first. Ladies. You have that come-to moment. And from now, you're able to move on and repair things. That's the point. But if all you ever do is walk around and kind of keep it all inside your own head, and you never admit, I did something wrong to you, and it was wrong, and I'm sorry, will you forgive me? If you don't have that moment, you never really repair what was there. It just starts to disintegrate. You may have some kind of, you know, working of a sort of an odd relationship, but until the hurt, until the wrong is addressed right to its face, it never really gets any better than how it is right now. There's always that grudge being held. That's on the human level. Well, it's like this in the divine level, too, in the spiritual level. We can't really kind of get beyond where we are with God unless we walk up to him and say, you love me infinitely, and I've done something wrong, and I need a come-to moment right now in confession. I need to hear your priest say, God, the Father of mercies, through the death and resurrection of his Son, has sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. Through the ministry of the church, 
May God grant you peace and pardon, and I absolve you from all your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Next to the words, this is my body, and this is the chalice of my blood, those words are the most beautiful words in human history, because those words bring the dead back to life. They restore life. They bring you back to where you were. And unlike some of our earthly friends who won't forgive us, or at least not then, God will always forgive us. He wants to forgive us. The sun wants to come through the window, but the window's too dirty and smudgy for the light to come through. But the light wants to come through, it's sitting on the other side of the window going, I want to come in, I want to come in, come on, I want to come in. Clean off the window and it comes in. That's what confession is. That's what confession is. God wants to brilliantly light up our souls. He wants to do that. There's nothing we can do to make him not want to do that. No matter how deep a sin we're in, he will always want to do that. All we have to do is say, I'm sorry. That's what confession's for. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. Sacred Heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.